Hello and welcome to this video. It's an analysis of Act 1, Scene 4 of William Shakespeare's Macbeth. And um, hopefully you've been watching the entire series, alternating between translating the scenes into modern language and then analysing them. Everything in this series is taken from Mr Bruff's Guide to Macbeth, so pick it up for just £2 by following the link in the description. The first thing I want to talk about with this scene is dramatic irony, which is a device that Shakespeare uses to increase the drama and tension in his plays. Dramatic irony is where a character is unaware of a crucial bit of information of which the audience themselves are aware, and this way we watch the character make decisions without the full picture and it gives the audience a sense of being involved in the play. We desperately want to share the knowledge we have and shout out, you know, don't do it, but obviously we cannot. In this scene, Shakespeare makes use of dramatic irony in quite an important way. We're told that the Thane of Cawdor, who turned traitor, has been executed, but we're also told about how he died, which in this honour-bound masculine society is very important. He died a good death, according to Malcolm, which is in contrast to how Macbeth takes on the title of Cawdor. The audience already knows Macbeth is considering killing Duncan to take the throne from the previous scene, so in that sense, everything here is dramatic irony. Macbeth takes on the title of someone who was a traitor, and he himself has betrayal of the worst kind on his mind. Duncan talks about how difficult it is to know when so what someone's thinking from... Uh, when they themselves are trying to keep it hidden. Um, he says it's difficult to find the man's construction in the face. He goes on to tell us that he was a man in whom I put an absolute trust, and we know that another man who he trusts completely is his peerless kinsman, Macbeth, who is also plotting something which he wants to keep hidden. So in this scene, the audience is being shown how Macbeth's journey into deception, evil and brutality is beginning even now, not long after the witches made their prophecies. Duncan heaps praise on Macbeth for his part in the battle, almost to the point of embarrassing himself. Um, he says something which is quite bizarre. He says, my plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. So he's saying that he's so happy he could cry. Whereas Macbeth responds in short, basic language, which shows the audience that he's not on the same wavelength as Duncan, he can't be as happy as him because the thoughts in his mind simply aren't happy thoughts. Shakespeare does this often throughout the play. He uses the language his characters speak to point out differences. The hyperbolic, overblown language of Duncan shows the audience he's completely unaware of what's going on behind the scenes, and Shakespeare uses this to create a sense of anticipation in his audience. We are watching Duncan heap lavish praise on the man who wants to kill him. Macbeth gives a speech about how loyal he is, how doing service and protecting the king in itself is a reward. He says the service and loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Macbeth here is doing exactly what the previous Thane of Cawdor did, hiding his real thoughts in false words. And this shows us that Macbeth has decided he's going to be treacherous and hide his true feelings from everybody around, which is one of the key themes in the entire play. This scene also has one of the most crucial elements in the play. In Scotland at the time, the king was allowed to name his successor, and that person didn't necessarily have to be in his own family. This was to prevent any fighting and disputes between noblemen in the event that the king died suddenly. Well, Duncan names his son Malcolm as his successor. Um, the successor is named the Prince of Cumberland. And you see I've got a little Cumberland sausage there. This effectively seals Duncan's fate, as Macbeth now believes he has no choice but to kill Duncan to be king. And once he hears this news, Macbeth barely gives a response before riding off to his castle to help his wife prepare for the king and the noblemen who are coming to stay that evening. Macbeth's line to himself immediately before he leaves the rest of the noblemen and the king is quite telling. He says, The Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on, what, on which I must fall down or else owe a leap. Um, for in my way it lies. Stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. Here he is admitting that he will need to do something terrible to become king. He sees Malcolm being named a successor 
as something he must overcome. And this focuses his mind on what needs to be done, and he asks the stars to not shine light on his plans. This will become a very important theme throughout the rest of the play, appearances versus reality, things being hidden from sight, and what is versus what is not. So I hope you found this video useful. Please do subscribe and give the video a thumbs up. It really does help.